This conference will now be recorded. Happy New Year. Welcome to the class. So today I'll be just discussing interpartum care because the uh, guideline has been updated in September 2023. And uh, fetal, they have put this guideline in two parts. Fetal monitoring and interpartum care they have separated. Fetal monitoring we have already done uh, in previous classes. Now what are the updates? I'll just speak about that. So, uh, like, uh, very basic, what they say that all the women, uh, what are the recommendation? All the women should have an antenatal education. What about the latent stage of labor? What, what type of pain? How to contact? Whom to contact? Apart from this, in the antenatal education, they do have antenatal classes and also midwife, they uh, explain also that they should give clear knowledge to the patient how the Baxton Hicks contraction or what will be the, how it will be the active labor pains. Clear explanation about, about the contraction, how are the contraction, how they will last, about the breakage, water break or amniotic fluid and what is the like description of the normal vaginal loss so that the patient can understand when she has to see uh, and uh, the emergency or maternity or when she's about to deliver so like this is a recommendation about the antenatal education for the labor to the patient then in uk you know there are three settings where the patient can deliver both multi para and nulli para may choose their option settings in uk it is always chosen by the patient not decided by the doctor so there are three homes four home settings there are ho uh, home like home birth is allowed uh, there would be free standing midwifery unit in the alongside midwifery unit in the obstetric now the midwifery units they uh, have two are there free standing they would be somewhere in the community and uh, uh, like uh, alongside midwifery unit would be in the hospital uh, like uh, same campus of the hospital so the difference would be, though the working would be same in both, but in alongside midwifery unit, if something uh, goes wrong and the patient requires transfer, so it is just in next building or the same building, so time taken will be less. Obstetric unit, we already know, we work in a hospital, these are the obstetric unit. And both kind of options are available to both women. Now, what they uh, say for the low risk primary para, so if uh, the um, for primary gravida patient if the birth is done at home or freestanding unit that means not attached to the hospital then the vaginal rate would be higher as compared to alongside unit because in alongside unit it is in the hospital campus so whenever the small thing is there she will be shifted so at birth uh, like in home and freestanding unit there are very high chances of vaginal birth second this we already know this was there in the previous guideline also if uh, in obstetric unit a rate of intervention would be high like instrumental birth a cesarean section and episiotomy because they would have got low threshold for all this so the interventions would be high but if we see uh, outcome for the baby in planning midwifery unit uh, freestanding unit and uh, obstetric unit outcome for baby would be same okay there would be no change in the outcome in these settings but if the home uh, if the planning of birth is done at home then there is a small uh, increase in adverse outcome for the baby so uh, this is important because it can come as a stem for part two people part three people it is important because if you are getting you know priming gravida patient who is looking for the home birth then in the counseling you have to use all this kind of counseling so it becomes important and they want everything from the uh, uh, their guidelines now low risk multi para so what we uh, what they say that uh, like planning birth at home in midwifery units more uh, chances of vaginal uh, birth is there uh, as compared to planning alongside unit apart from this with the obstetric unit it is same that interventions would be higher okay whether it is low risk primary para or whether it could be low risk multi para but this is there is a difference okay there is a difference there is no difference in the outcome for the baby whether they plan birth in any setting but in low risk multi para 
if sorry in low risk primary para if they plan birth at home then there is a small increase in adverse outcome for the baby but it is not there for the low risk multi para so this is difference rest everything is same and this part is important because it would be used in your counseling now information what has to be given to the patient uh, about the during pregnancy about the labor like uh, usually they have got a designated midwife and they would be usually cared by that midwife okay but if it is in if the patient is delivering in the hospital the same midwife would not be there okay how they can access the midwifery care obstetric and obstetric and neonatal staff what were about the uh, water birth is allowed in uk so what about availability of birthing poles and what kind of pain reliefs like antox would be there that in the medical term they called as a gas and air there could be medications methadone dimorphine apart from this uh, about the, in this guideline they have added couple of things in the uh, like analgesia section so they have put the patient pca or patient control analgesia and regional analgesia was all is also there so all this information patient should know uh, during the pregnancy only now this this uh, is important you know for the part two people what is the more this this table are from the guideline only what are the most common reason for transfer so answer for your question is delay in first and second stage of labor and what is the percentage that is 32.4 if you wish you can remember otherwise this is the most common reason then uh, this question also come and you part 3 people has to put in the counseling also how much is the <coughs> how much is the transfer rate if the patient consider home birth and how much is the rate of transfer to the obstetric unit so answer will be 45% this number is important for both people uh, what could be the transfer rate for multi para so it was like exact is 11.5 but previously like we are around uh, figure it is 10% so this is a transfer rate and this transfer rates uh, you have to quote in the part 3 station and you have to uh, answer direct in the part 2 it comes as a question also apart from this this part though it they have already put uh, in the like uh, obesity guideline but new uh, but uh, in new uh, intrapartum guideline this section has been added new so they are doing bmi uh, at during at the booking visit always they check bmi now if the bmi is above 35 so what kind of discussion would be done for the patient so this section has been newly added in this guideline possibility of unplanned section pph transfer increased chances of transfer and stillbirth neonatal death and a baby requiring any kind of neonatal support or neonatal care apart from this risk of multi uh, complication are both for whether the patient is nulli para or whether the patient is multi but if we consider parity the complication risk would be higher for the nulli para patient um, if the bmi is 35 apart from this uh, if the complication arises so we already know that the advanced care will be more care uh, quickly given in the hospital rather than any kind of uh, like uh, free standing unit or uh, like at, at the home because that time the patient would require to be transferred this part has been uh, 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 like discussion about the bmi above 35 this has been added new in this guideline now this table was before also and few of the things you should remember also because uh, when you are kind of Uh, doing booking visit then you have to refer the patient to consultant led care or you have to refer the patient to obstetric unit so these would be the medical conditions that uh, in those medical conditions you, uh, any question anyone some voice was there all of you guys can mute your yourself you know okay so uh, like uh, so if patient has got some medical condition so in that situation the patient care will be in the obstetric unit only so the risk assessment is done okay so these are these are the condition at least one overview of this is very important because sometime you know you uh, um, 
and it may be asked but the number all you should always number i think you should always remember now uh, apart from this these are the medical conditions they would require uh, individual assessment okay so important to remember if the anemia hemoglobin is eight, uh, in between 8.5 to 10.5 at the onset of labor that time individual assessment is required apart from this if uh, like uh, hepatitis b and c but the liver functions are normal pediatric review would be required apart from this if there is liver condition but right now it is in a stable condition so these are the kind of condition where individual uh, assessment is required uh, apart from this there are certain obstetric factor also that uh, so this was the medical condition because of that we are uh, putting the patient in obstetric care and these are the some uh, uh, like uh, um, um, other factors so the pregnancy related factors or some sort of previous gynecology surgery previous complication in this also it is important that you will a uh, patient uh, to be uh, delivered in the hospital so this would be sort of uh, important now again this is uh, the same factors are continued uh, if they require delivery in the hospital now uh, you have to remember that grand multipara four grand multipara parity uh, four or more they want to deliver in a hospital so th there should be individual assessment we already know that multiparity is a high risk factor for pph apart from this age over 40 at or overbooking this part it was not there in previous guideline this age uh, uh, current pregnancy age 40 or over uh, at booking so this uh, this is one of the factor the patient uh, require uh, like individual assessment for the birth and this part this they have added new in this guideline okay previously it was not there now uh, coming to the communication so it, it it has to be very clear communication whatever the patient wants to you know information you have to give so uh, if like uh, you get a patient of another language so appropriate uh, interpreting services has to be used okay this you you uh, you have to find, do in your part 3 exam also if you find a patient from other country you have to ask about the language line apart from this it comes in your part two question many times it comes that you have to use the uh, interpreter uh, though, though are not the relatives of the patient okay uh, if uh, you find a patient of another language uh, then uh, professional interpreters has to be called now, that should be not you know they can't be family members so um, apart from this if the patient has got any special health need accordingly they have to arrange communication now uh, this uh, this part is important B basically this is important for part three people sometime you know uh, you will uh, find us uh, like uh, a task and the patient is in the labor so like that time uh, what you have to take care of when you talk to the patient so this is all about that is very important so uh, like uh, first of all uh, um, always uh, there should be you know greeting to the patient patient should always it is important to ask that you know how she wants to be called so uh, apart from this her privacy dignity has to be maintained and she, uh, you have to ask whether she has got any concern apart from this you uh, should know about her labor plan or birth uh, uh, preferences because you have to uh, always the patient have a birth plan so you have to kind of ask or review the birth plan then it is important to look for the pain relief options apart from this whatever uh, uh, like uh, observations or in uh, you are doing or what the procedure you have are doing always it you have to take the consent always you have to take the consent and patient, whenever there is a change in the leg shift there should be handover of the care to other professional now this uh, this or oh, everything what the nice has written when you see a patient and the patient is in the labor and you have to do that task you have to do all these things because in part three exam laboring stations are come in that you have to do whatever they want uh, you know you have to follow the all steps of communication what the uh, like uh, this nice guideline they have 
it is a very cl clear now the you know things are um, become very clear when you know this how you have to do communication to the laboring patient now apart from this is again uh, you may be asked question about the position so patient can uh, use whatever the position she is happy with except she can't lie down flat except she can't lie down flat uh, flat so this is um, uh, this is like change in the 2023 apart from this support uh, is always must okay uh, uh, now transfer of care so this few things has been added new in this guideline and that both uh, you guys for part two and part three people should know now uh, like uh, a, a transfer of care there is a separate question they ask in part three so it is important to know so first of all the patient should know the reason why they are getting transferred and they should know like the, the, her wishes to be respected consent has to be taken midwife who is attending the labor the midwife should uh, uh, like uh, she will contact the ambulance service and obstetric midwife of uh, coordinating of uh, midwife of the other obst obstetric hospital and the relevant a contact will be done at all three levels okay in part three there is a question how you will arrange transfer of the patient so this is the knowledge that the guys want from you that uh, like uh, uh, review the reason um, answer the concern take the co informed consent and how the uh, like whom the pe what type of people will be coordinated in another hospital like all uh, coordinating midwife uh, in the obstetric hospital and all relevant uh, professional to be contacted so this is important to know okay apart from this this has been added new in the guideline now transfers they have divided uh, uh, in category one and category two this is a new thing and if a patient has a life threatening condition then ambulance service category is one okay and if it is urgent for example pain relief then uh, ambulance service category is two so you may get any question from here because this this uh, like categories about the ambulance services category one and two they has been added new in this guideline previously it was not there okay now how to arrange care again they have given the steps so as they say that it, it patient should be nicely covered uh, um, wrapped in the blanket she should be given complete advice about whatever the position she wish she can opt now transfer uh, when it is made so midwife should be involved apart from this if it is monitoring is required during uh, her transfer so it should be arranged like uh, as per appropriate for the stage of labor intermittent uh, um, auscultation of fetal heart if it is possible and this again has been added new in 2023 that women's companion can travel with her in the ambulance if she wants and the healthcare team agrees so these are the few things you should know because when you kind of you know arrange transfer so you have to speak about all these things now pain relief pain relief part of this guideline they have added so many new things and that you should know so like uh, whenever the pain relief is offered then you, they're all uh, like uh, neurodiverse conditions and uh, their uh, socioeconomic status their beliefs everything has to be respected now what are the uh, pain relieving uh, strategies what they are saying now uh, breathing exercises shower ba uh, bath and massage so this can reduce pain in the first stage of latent first stage of labor but they are saying no to aroma uh, therapy yoga and acupuncture no to uh, like uh, aroma yoga and acupuncture yes so this part you should know so some breathing exercises she, uh, she can take bath or shower or massages so these are the pain relieving uh, strategies during latent stage of labor recommended by the nice apart from this they have added this uh, pain relieving strategies so this is the tense 
tens is uh, uh, tens the full is transcutaneous electric nerve stimulation usually uh, like this kind of, some kind of machine is there this kind of uh, you know leads are there leads are attached to the pa patient then some currents are passed okay so this way usually uh, the tens happen and uh, now what they this uh, tens uh, uh, has this technique has been added first time in this guideline though in the, in the on the nhs website it was previously given so tens machine like uh, usually not provided by nhs but if people uh, you people can hire these machines okay apart from this uh, it is little evidence that in established labor uh, the tens has got any role and uh, Okay, so uh, and how it works i'll be just speaking but this time they have put tense as a pain relieving strategies so when you are offering this uh clay pain relief you have to speak about the tense also now uh what they say that uh, uh, choice of their music can be played in the labor apart from this uh, they can uh, clay uh, they can choose for the water bird if it is but the patient should not be pyrexial and the temperature of the pool should not be above 37.5 so these few things are important because important for the part 3 also and along with the part 2 because sometimes the patient will want water birth or in the pool birth so you have to kind of look for something uh, one of them is the temperature so if the temperature is there you have to say no and this is the temperature should not exceed this this is necessary for part two people and apart from this uh, this is a nice recommendation about the water birth so what they say there is a like uh, insufficient high quality evidence either to to support or discourage giving birth in the water so uh, sometime the role player will ask you a question then you can say that uh, it's your choice but we don't have en enough evidence to support or to you know re uh, re um, uh, refuse it also so this line would be the important now a new this also they have added new thing so tense they have added in the pain relief <laughs> another thing that they have added is the sterile water injections now sterile water injections uh, they can be given intracutaneous and subcut uh, subcutaneous and uh, usually uh, as a pain relief option uh, if the woman having labor pain along with the back pain uh, has to be given by the trained person only so uh, it provides relief from, of, of back pain um, from 10 minutes after injection up to three hours but initially when the injection is put there could be some initial stinging sensation could be there and now how it is given there are four different injection points around the rhombus or of michaelis and the doses of 0.1 ml intracutaneous and 0.5 ml subcutaneous at each injection point you uh, this rhombus of michaelis uh, is a kite shaped area that include three lower vertebra that that includes three lower lumbar vertebra so you can just imagine that at the lower three vertebra there would be the like uh, like a quiet shape there would be four points and oh, those points is ca called uh, that called as a rhombus of michaelis and there they are giving sterile water injections it could be intracutaneous or subcutaneous and uh, like uh, apart from this only 0.1 ml intracutaneous less space 0.1 ml will be the dose and for subcutaneous 0.5 ml would be the dose and usually pain relief will uh, occur after 10 minutes to 3 hours there could be initial stinging sensation now th this is uh, the sterile water injection this is new thing that you know added in this guideline it was previously not there now this is from the internet how it works so like couple of theories are there what they say that it causes irritation on the skin that cause a release of endorphin and uh, because because of that there is a pain relief Even, uh, similar kind of mechanism of action is for the tense machine also tense machine causes irritation in the skin 
that would release to endorphin release and that would cause uh, pain relief for the woman is is this clear till now people anyone any question no question okay so this is a, again a new identity so both part two and part three people should know that because uh, role player may ask this apart from this it was previously also uh, this is like uh, gas in the like uh, patient language we called this as gas this is entox and tox has 50 50 uh, mixture of the oxygen and nitrous oxide so this uh, number is important for part two though you know it uh, already and uh, like uh, it makes the woman feel nauseous and lightheaded so uh, gas in air also you offer the patient as uh, like pain relief option apart from this uh, now coming to the pharmacological uh, analgesia so this was what uh, we were doing was a non-pharmacological now about the drugs that can or medication that can be used so pethidine dimorphine other opioids they want that it should be there in all but settings and usually uh, if the pain relief is this kind of pain relief is given so she may have some problems such as drowsiness nausea vomiting and what can happen to baby baby can have short-term respiratory depression drowsiness it may take few days or may make them more difficult to breastfeed so when when you are kind of doing uh, so uh, counseling for this uh, kind of uh, analgesia so you have to speak about that apart from this uh, uh, always if it is um, opioid injections are used so antiemetic has to be given beforehand because it cause uh, patient may have nausea and vomiting and if the if patient it causes patient to get drowsy apart from this it causes some it, it do have an effect on respiration also so it is advised that patient if the injection opioid injection has been given patient should not go in the birth pool at least for uh, within two hours of it because you we understand there could be possibility of aspiration now this is again new identity that they have you they have put in the new guideline it, previously it was not there so uh, though there was there had been a talk about remy uh, fentanyl but now it it came in the nice intrapartum guideline also so remy fentanyl is the patient control analgesia so patient control analgesia like this uh, uh, kind of system is there so they put some infusion and this machine is kind of connected like this so patient have got this control so like patient can put the knob and the analgesia will on when they are comfortable and when the pain is again then they can uh, they, they can again um, put the knob so it is controlled by the patient so this is pca or the patient controlled analgesia and now remy fentanyl can be given and the 40 microgram uh to uh, uh, like within two minute lock uh, to uh, uh per bolus with with the, with a two minute lockout period time so uh dose may be important for part two i don't know you because it has been added new so they may ask you a question so it is 40 microgram per bolus with a two minute lockout period okay apart from this it causes uh respiratory depression so Remy fentanyl uh, should be offered in obstetric unit also already because uh, if the respiratory problem is there maybe they need anesthetic support and anesthetic support will only be in the hospitals or in the obstetric unit okay apart from this if they are using Remy fentanyl uh, PCA so good analgesia so they would uh, there would be less likely to require uh, epidural forcep and ventus and there would be highly likely uh, chances for vaginal birth and need for oxygen so this everything is necessary for both two and three people because this your part two people directly question can come at because this is a newly added part and part three people the role player can ask about this kind of anal analgesic whether uh, is uh, uh, it is like uh, it is by S 
so again uh, this is a sort of an infusion pump is there but whether it will be on and off that will be controlled by patient okay so again uh, while using remifentanil there should be continuous support one to one care there should be continuous ctg monitoring there could be should be monitoring for respiratory function respiratory rate uh, or uh, 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 and also the pulse oximetry there should be uh, clear guidelines for uh, if there is a respiratory depression how to manage that oxygen to be available immediately and immediate anesthetic support is available because there could be respiratory depression okay so these are the few things that you should know about remifentanil pca so uh, this is like uh, previ previously also it was similar in the guideline hardly anything has been changed regional analgesia so regional analgesia we know it is there in the obstetric unit it doesn't cause any long-term backache it doesn't cause longer first stage of labor or increased chance of unplanned cesarean section but yes as we already know we are using it in our labor wards so the usually the patient you know pushing is late so longer uh, second stage of labor and increased chance of instrumental birth could be there apart from this what they have this line they have added in 2023 there should be intensive monitoring and iv access but uh, if the regional analgesia uh, is there and that you uh, because if the iv access is there but obviously the mobility of patient will be reduced now uh, if rapid analgesia is needed then what to be used it is combined spinal epidural so this is the rapid analgesia combined spinal and epidural and what to be used here it to be bupivacaine and fentanyl bupivacaine and fentanyl is used apart from this uh, they want to uh, like uh, offer low uh, low concentration local anesthetic and fentanyl solution and the initial dose will be test dose when they're giving it very uh, initially so uh, have to be very careful why because there could be intrathecal they convert it and puncture could be there or maybe sometime intravascular placement of epidural catheter may be there so it has to be real slow at the initial and this is the doses and doses for part two people is important so it is 0.025 percent to 0.1 percent of bupivacaine and two microgram per ml of fentanyl so this is the dosing so part three people is not necessary but yeah part two people this part is important to know there is no change it was same in the previous guideline now uh, recently they said that there has to have an uh, like uh, additional intensive monitoring when the patient is on regional analgesia so what they want like uh, if the 10 ml or more of low dose solution has been given blood pressure has to be monitored every five minutes for first 15 minutes apart from this sensory block has to be checked uh, hourly basis if the patient is not mobilizing motor block hourly has to be uh, checked how asking the patient to do straight leg raise she can opt any position but except lying lying down flat so um, this kind of few thing that the monitoring uh, is usually done with the regional analgesia there is no change it was same in the previous guideline also now till what time the analgesia to be like doses to be given till the uh, after the completion of third stage apart from this if any repair so till the repair uh, you know regional analgesia can be continued now this is uh, uh, this is also they have added new in the guideline if the patient is on epidural and if the like um, full dilatation is there then uh, pushing can be delayed for multi one hour and for a primary uh, primary patient or nali para um, for two hours okay maybe they're fully dilated and uh, so and if they are on epidural for multi para they can uh, pushing can be delayed by one hour for okay, uh, nali para it can be delayed by two hours so this part has been added new in this guideline very important for the people who are just appearing for the part two next week 
so this this part is newly added now what they say about pre uh, labor uh, rupture of the membrane so whenever the pre labor pre term uh, pre labor rupture of membrane but at term okay pre labor rupture of membrane but at term so there should be risk assessment so all this risk factor they would look for so uh, all this risk factor they would look for and like meconium stained liquor bleeding blood stained liquor reduced fetal movement continuous pain and gbs carriage where women feeling unwell iugr and low lying presenta if these factors are there or there is a uncertainty the patient has to report immediately now this part has been again there had been a new thing it was not there previously so uh, they have added this part like uh, if the uh, patient is at 37 weeks of pregnancy with suspected rupture now they have put the word suspected rupture here so if there is suspected rupture and these are the risk factors okay and if these risk factors are not there then either the patient can be induced immediately or after 12 hours okay or after 12 hours so this uh, this part they have added new in the guideline so it is important that you should know the risk factors because if you are uh, in the question if your patient has got no risk factor and you, there is a suspicion of rupture it is not like uh, you are sure of it if it is suspected rupture I, either the patient can be uh, uh, induced immediately or within 12 hours or within 12 hours but if there is change she has to report so this part was not there in previous guideline now uh, this part uh, it is important now a risk of neonatal infection is 1% and 0.2 um, 0.5% if the patient has a risk uh, like uh, intact membrane this numbers we are reading from you know a long time and the numbers are same only and um, if the rupture of membrane is there usually 60% of the women would go in labor within 24 hours this numbers are important for part 2 and these are same from the uh, like many years this numbers are same now this we used to do uh, this we know and this we used to do previously it was there so when the patient has a rupture of membrane at term then either there could be expectant management for 24 hours or there could be induction as early as possible this part was there in the previous guideline and there had been no change in that also only uh, previously what i discussed about the suspected rupture this part they have changed but this part is again the same now if the patient use uh, um, comes you after 20, if the rupture of membrane is there at term so induction uh, can be offered if the labor is not started naturally after 24 hours so this was there in the previous guideline also now if the patient uh, want to you know wait for more than 24 hours so what should not be done no vaginal swab and no c reactive protein there should be temperature monitoring and patient to be reported patient to be reviewed every 24 hours and uh, she has to report if there is a decrease in the fetal movement and uh, patient to be explained that baby may require to stay uh, for observation 12 hours after the birth so why these points are important for the part 2 there could be a question and for part 3 people you may get a station where the rupture of membrane is there and the patient is refusing you know uh, and uh, like uh, labor to be started so the, uh, you have to put the uh, answer from like these points you have to cover in the answer this was there previously also this part also we know uh, this just a repetition if the patient has gbs infection and there is a rupture of membrane at at or after 37 weeks it is immediate induction it is immediate induction or if the cesarean section for any factor then cesarean section so there is no change here and it is same in the gbs guideline also now till now any one of you have got any question okay now coming to the labor so for uh, we know the stages of labor so there first stage of labor so there are two parts this is this definition has not changed 
so for latent stage of labor it is less than 4 cm uh, and there is some cervical change and uh, established when the patient has got more regular painful contraction and progressive dilatation from 4 cm this we know from uh, this uh, definition is same now sometimes uh, uh, you get a question in part 2 usually it comes and the patient would not in labor so what you will do you just support her provide her analgesia and ask her to go back home okay so sometimes this this could be the answer in your emq and sba now if then the patient is in, is in the labor how the things are happen usually either uh, if the patient because uh, um, and in the antenatal education they uh, give them all information about the labor pains and everything now if when they are in the labor so they would be either face to face uh, they will see the patient or they would be telephone trial and what type of assessment you know to be done when the patient is coming to you in the come, come for the labor so this like first uh, as the every patient will have plan so first looking at the notes and looking at the plan then assessment what will be the assessment about the contraction frequency uh, strength and duration recording of uh, like uh, vitals checking for urine or urine protein or urine analysis, speaking about the pain relief options any vaginal loss looking whether she requires any gbs profile access so if any uh, and uh, like uh, if they, they think that the patient is not in the labor so with her consent maintaining her privacy her vaginal examination is done and if the PV is done, what they will know? This, this we are doing on the daily basis. Station, position, plus and minus caput, cervical dilatation, effacement, plus and minus membrane. So these, when the patient comes uh, in the labor, so these are the assessment done. Now, what will be done for the uh, unborn baby? Usually, you have to take a review whether the what type of movement she had in last four, 24 hours. Fundal height, lie, presentation, position, engagement. So all these things you have to ask, uh, is review the patient, uh, see the patient. And auscultation of fetal heart minimum 60 seconds or one minute after contraction. So this is important part. This was same in fetal monitoring guideline. It was there in previous guideline also. So and it comes as a question also. Auscultation of fetal heart has to be done minimum one minute after contraction is over if like there is any uh, like suspicion or queries there then like uh, they can check uh, same same time uh, the uh, uh, patient's pulse can be uh, palpated so if whether, whether you're looking same or not it will be uh, you'll be able to differentiate it so this will be the observation now usually the assessment in in uk so it is done by midwife. Uh, so they would do all the assessment. After, they will re review the records, review the care plan, and review the. They will do the all assessment. After that, if there are some factors are there, they would consider the patient transferring to the obstetric unit. Okay, we just spoke about the transfer, and these are the parameters they will look for, and the patient to be trans uh, transferred to the um, obstetric unit. So here, fresh red bleeding and blood stain liquor has been added. Previously, everything was same. So if patient has tachycardia, if patient has high blood pressure, if patient has got uh, like a, uh, a temp high temperature or blood stain liquor, this would be indications to transfer to the obstetric unit. But part two people, you have to read it like clearly because they may ask you a question. Now, again, this is the same thing. If there had been rupture of membrane more than 24 hours, presence of meconium, there is a delay in first or second stage of layer, labor. Uh, there is requirement for additional pain relief, rather uh, such as regional analgesia, or if there had been an obstetric emergency. So uh, these kind of condition, when the transfer to the obstetric unit would be done. This is the indication for transfer of obstetric unit from the fetus side non cephalic presentation high fetal head iugr oligohydromnios concern with the fetal monitoring reduced fetal movement last 24 hours so these are the indications for refer 
now when the patient is already admitted we know in uk it is one to one care and supportive one to one care usually for acidity they usually of uh, like arrange uh, this uh, proton pump inhibitor it is not like for everyone but if the patient really uh, uh, receives opioid as a pain relief or if there could be possibility of cesarean section apart from this they can take isotonic drink that is more beneficial and light diet unless there is a possibility of uh, like going through uh, cesarean section and the general uh, anesthetic is required so this part is important and this part has been added new in the guideline frequency of observation in first stage of labor so th there is a change here now uh, contraction we are looking in first stage of labor half hourly pulse one hourly apart from this four hourly all this temperature blood pressure per vaginal examination respiratory rate and bladder care out of this respiratory rate and bladder care has been added new in this guideline previously it was not there now uh, what they uh, uh, like uh, added about the bladder care so these are the part so they want that bladder care for the woman at least four hourly so um, like freak, uh, need to assess frequency of passing urine and the bladder sensation apart from this fluid balance monitoring if the sensation is abnormal or absent or patient is not able to pass urine or receiving uh, iv fluids including oxytocin because we know oxytocin causes uh, like uh, um, retention apart from the so uh, fluid balance monitoring if the patient is like uh, if the patient is not able to sense or like if the sensation for the urination is absent okay apart from this uh, if there is any concern she is not able to pass urine you uh, offer to insert a catheter so these are the few things that they have added about the bladder care in uh, in first stage of labor in this guideline it was not there previously so this these details of the bladder care is important because you uh, you have to put this into your stations if you are doing labor care station labor stations and part two it is very important newly added uh, change now uh, how much is the assessment to be done usually like uh, a risk assessment has to be done on hourly basis hourly basis or like risk uh, because i have just uh, in pre uh, previous slides i have ex explained you what are the indications of referral to the obstetric unit so if the uh, like maybe the patient is fine but during labor they may develop some complications such as confirmed delay meconium uh, bleeding fresh bleeding so or, or any obstetric emergency so all these kind of risk assessment has to be done hourly basis so that the uh, patient can be shifted to uh, obstetric unit now this is few thing they have added about the meconium so if the meconium is there uh, transfer to the obstetric lad care okay so um, apart from this what explanation to the woman there is increased risk to baby Uh, the, it is it would be the reason for continuous fetal heart monitoring and it made it sure that the professional is there who can provide uh, neonatal life support okay and apart from this meconium is more common in full term baby uh, so these are the few things they have put in the meconium previously in previous guideline it was uh, like uh, light meconium significant meconium and also fbs was there so now from this new guideline all this thing has been removed now they have just wrote the meconium and apart from this uh, this we already know from the fetal monitoring guideline that fetal blood uh, um, fbs or fetal blood sampling has already been uh, like um, uh, they have removed it from the practice so only this much they wrote about the meconium rest what how the monitoring and whatever is done about the meconium it is already there in the fetal monitoring guideline now first stage of labor uh, this is like same what can be changed there so uh, in uh, 
about the meconium only this much of the knowledge is there about the light or tinged or uh, significant they have not written okay only this much they wrote about the meconium so uh, a primary patient uh, primary gravida average first stage of labor is 8 hours but un, uh, usually unlikely to be uh, more than 18 hours okay so 8 by 18 multipara 5 hours average first stage it can unlikely last more than 12 hours okay it is same there is no change here now if there is a delay suspected then uh, need to look at the parity of the patient dilatation and how much the dilatation is progressing and the contractions and a uh, station position of the, uh, the fetal part okay presenting part now uh, if you are if it is suspected offer women support hydration and appropriate pain relief so uh, this was there previously also but yeah this they have uh, highlighted in 2023 guideline so offer support hydration appropriate uh, pain relief now uh, when the delay in the first stage of labor is suspected so uh, like uh, when the dilatation is less than four, uh, two centimeter in four hours and uh, it, it, this is same for the primary gravidas and also multi gravidas apart from this if there is like concern with the, um, the contraction strength and also with the descent and rotation of the baby's head so this these are the few things then you will suspect that that yes there is a delayed in the first stage of labor is there suspicion is there now what to do so if you are suspecting then offer options to the patient support pain relief and pv hour to uh, pv after two hours okay if you are now suspecting that yes there had been delayed in the first stage of labor now these are the option first line uh, you will offer now if you do pv after two hours and uh, progress is less than one centimeter then you have to kind of diagnose delay and if the membranes are present then uh, do arm and uh, do PV after two hours and if there is no progress then diagnose delay now if the diagnosed delay is there what you will do either consider transfer to obstetric unit if the patient is in midwifery led care a proper assessment of per, per abdominal and per vaginal examination and in consideration for oxytocin okay so this is like kind of you know how to do, uh, do uh, this will, this flow chart will explain you how what how you will answer if you find that yes there is a delay in the first stage of labor is there okay so i'm Mama, really, i have a doubt can i ask yes uh, here uh, when we are suspecting delay that is less than 2 cm in 4 hours uh, okay. and if membranes are intact do we do arm then or we wait for two more hours and then do arm no so uh, like uh, if the diagnosis uh, if the suspicion is there so if the patient has got membrane you do arm and do pv after two hour if it is like no progress then you diagnose delay this is for the situation when the membranes are there another situation when the membranes are not there or it is sort of query then uh, you offer them support pain relief and do pv after two centimeter two hours and if it is less than one centimeter then you again diagnose delay so it is the same is it clear uh, so ma'am when we're doing arm we do after four hours we, uh, and if no. Uh, no no why for from where this uh, see if you have this kind of suspicion four hours are passed and it is progresses less than two centimeter then you will suspect delay now yes. suspect delay there could be two type of patient one type of patient without membrane if the patient is without membrane you uh, give all the option of support pain relief and again do pv after two hours and if it is less than one centimeter then you will diagnose delay second yes. set of patients membrane are there you do arm and after two hours again do pv if it is 
no progress, then again you diagnose delay. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay. And if your de delay is diagnosed, then either if, if the patient is midway free led unit, your answer will be transfer. Or if you are in obstetric unit, then you reassess the patient PAPV and consider oxytocin. That will depend on your con contractions. Okay. Now, what this uh, tell you, uh, uh, say something about the oxytocin. Here, few changes are there. Whenever the oxytocin is, you know, uh, injection is started, so always the uh, uh, patient should have an adequate pain relief, either epidural. There should be monitoring of the baby heart. It can cause uh, hyperstimulation. So if the hyperstimulation is there, dose has to be reduced or stopped. And uh, like um, for oxytocin, separate uh, IV fluid without clinical indication is not required. And monitoring of fluid balance, if the, if the patient you are giving oxytocin, so this they have added new. Previously, this line was not there. Now, apart from this, uh, time, inter, uh, usually oxy oxytocin infusion is started. So time it, in between increasement, in, uh, increasing, increasing the dose would be 30 minutes. Okay. Apart from this, how much contraction you want? It is 3 to 4 in 10 minutes. So this is again change. Previously, it was 4 to 5. So now mm -hmm. they have put that the oxytocin increase uh, 3 to 4 contraction in 10 minutes. Okay, if the contraction are more than four, then what you will do? Either you stop or you uh, reduce the dose. Uh, but it, the contraction should not be more than four. Okay, so this part is new in this guideline. Apart from this, uh, if the patient is on oxytocin and the CDG becomes pathological, so immediate oxytocin has to be stopped or discontinued and, and uh, review, reviewed by the uh, senior obstetrician. But if the CDG has become normal, then you will review the patient again and restarting of oxytocin can be done in the first stage of labor. So all this, you know, this it is important to understand this, um, uh, uh, like uh, whatever written over here in the slide, because you can get, you know, a lot more number of questions from here. So understanding is important. So they may say that the patient was on oxyto 6 but the ctg it is discontinued because the ctg became pathological now the ctg is fine so your answer would be uh, re, uh, re redoing the full clinical assessment and restarting the oxytocin okay so understanding of this is very important so now this is the change here that i have already spoken and if the oxytocin uh, clake has been offered then PV has to be done after four hours. This part is same. Previous guideline, you do PV after four hours. In the four hours, if the progress is less than two centimeter, that means possibility uh, of cesarean section. And if cervical dilatation in after four hours, you do PV. If it is more than two centimeter, then uh, like um, four, uh, you continue with the labor progress. Then we, we do PV four hourly in the first stage. Okay. This part has not been changed in the guideline. Uh, so apart from this, so th that's all about the first stage of labor. Now, second stage of labor. Second stage of labor, uh, again, there are uh, it, uh, passive stage and active stage. Passive stage definition, it is all, it is the same when the dilatation is there, but patient has got no voluntary or involuntary pushing. Pushing is not there. And uh, uh, like uh, passive uh, uh, stage of labor can be like uh, more than uh, maybe up to two hours if the patient has epidural in uh, in place and patient is avoid delayed pushing. Okay, so this part added new that uh, if the patient has fully dilated, no urge to push. So uh, in epidural, you can wait for two hours more. Okay, so and this is part was. I mean, is it two it is, hours for both uh, primary and multi? Actually, when they wrote uh, uh, like uh, definition as a whole without specifying mm -hmm. the parity, they wrote two hours. But in upcoming uh, uh, slides, you will see that it is two hours for uh, uh, primary gravida and one hour for multi gravida. So we will consider as, two and one, ma'am. If it if they have mentioned the parity, 
if they have not mentioned parity then it will be two only what you can do but if they have mentioned it as multi par multi par weighted one not yes okay so uh, i'll be sp uh, i'll be explaining in the upcoming slides okay then active stage ac active second stage of labor we know when the baby is there and uh, uh, active pushing or involuntary pushings are there with the full dilatation of cervix this is active stage second stage of labor now how uh, how to do the observations observations would be like uh, fetal heart uh, auscultation every 5 minute this this is same and uh, apart from this uh, consideration to be given to position hydration coping strategies but the uh, another thing to remember that the pv examination is done in second stage of hourly hourly we are doing pv in second stage and what we are looking at in the second stage position of head descent caput molding because patient is already fully dilated so that uh, uh, message from here fetal heart uh, to be seen every 5 minute and uh, pv examination to be done uh, like um, every hour every hour per vaginal examination is done then this is again they have added new so what they say in the second stage of labor if the patient has epidural then uh, she should not lie on flat because we know there would be veno caval uh, compression because of that decrease return decrease bp and decrease blood flow would be there so she can lie her um, uh, she can lie on her side that increases the chances of spontaneous birth or she can uh, apart from this if she, uh, she can um, choose any position she is comfortable including the upright position also can, can be chosen okay so this is important to know apart from this uh, if the patient has got no epidural this is with the epidural if the patient has got no epidural lying flat should not be done apart from this she can use any position upright position and mobile position keeping mobile will be beneficial uh, will be uh, beneficial as long as uh, as they may reduce fetal heart abnormalities epistotomy rates and her birthing experience so now this part you may get question that with the upright position and keeping mobile what could be the benefits decrease in the fetal heart abnormalities the reason we already know in good blood flow uh, so baby will also get the you know good blood flow and the oxygen so decrease fetal heart abnormalities decrease epistotomy rate because if the patient is upright so there would be kind of pressure and improve birth experience so three things are improved when the patient is in upright position and keeping mobile so uh, like kind of learn that because part 2 they ask you know minor details now in this guideline they have uh, like uh, put this terms also spontaneous pushing spontaneous pushing and directed pushing spontaneous pushing that means like patient are pushing spontaneously and uh, like uh, this will but obvious if the patient is spontaneously pushing second stage of labor is going to be shorter only uh, than the directed push and what are the directed pushes you ask the patient to push whether uh, while she is exhaling so this this uh, if the direct this is the directed pushing and if the in the directed pushing second stage of labor will be shortened so um, but uh, spontaneous pushing as you understand is the better than the uh, directed pushing always then um, this part uh, many times the question comes if the dilatation of cervix is confirmed and patient has got no epidural and she has got no urge to push what to do carry out assessment after one hour so this is this this line uh, Uh, every uh, al uh, alternate exam there is always a question patient has got no epidural she is fully dilated no urge to push what to do please see after one hour so this is the answer so uh, the important part line for the part 2 people every alternate exam question come from here now uh, like uh, 
this what you were spe we was you were asking women with epidural in place now if the nali para is there delayed directed pushing uh, up to 2 hours of full dilatation may shorten the second stage of labor in multi para delayed or direct pushing uh, by 1 hour after full dilatation may shorten the second stage of labor so this they have added new in the guideline a uh, delayed pushing so uh, nali para you can ask uh, you can advise them for the delayed directed pushing up to 2 hours after full dilatation for multi para 1 hour after full dilatation so this is a new identity in this guideline now they have added so much here now if the uh, we are uh, speaking about the second stage of labor only okay nali para patient and the epidural is in place okay nali para patient and epidural is in the in the place so this part i have we, uh, we have just read that the directed pushing can be there up, up to 2 hours of full dilatation and for multi para delayed pushing can be up to 1 1 hour of full dilatation if if delayed pushing is done in uh, you know, multi gravida it will uh, reduce the need for um, operative delivery and will reduce the second stage of labor also and if you find the patient pushes are ineffective then support change in position emptying of bladder um, these are the strategies to be uh, like um, can be offered to the patient now this part has been added new in the guideline what are the intrapartum intervention to reduce perineal trauma what they recommend though it was it has already been added in the tear guideline warm wet compress on perineum and continue till birth okay warm wet compress on perineum and continue until birth and temperature to be checked it should be comfortable to the woman so this intervention reduces perineal trauma apart from this second thing what they say consider perineal massage with a water soluble lubricant in second stage of labor if it is acceptable to the woman and uh, if she prefers it okay so uh, like uh, uh, this part has been newly added but we knew it from our uh, like tear guideline that wet, warm wet compress on the perineum till birth and the perineal uh, and the massage with a water soluble lubricant in second stage these are the strategies to reduce perineal trauma but no to routine episiotomy and no to lignocaine spray okay so this also uh, important to be known by the part 2 people for episiotomy i will not speak too much about it uh, but the angle you should know so they want it uh, like uh, it is usually medio lateral originating a vaginal forchette directed to the right side and angle in from uh, it should be at an angle of 45 to 60 degree 45 to 60 degree okay i'll not speak too much about it here now this is important to know here now duration uh, um, uh, the, uh, this is all about the duration of the second stage of labor and delay so previous guideline they have not mentioned the patient with epidural without epidural though things and basic is still the same as it it was previously but now they have kind of made it more complicated they so now there are uh, uh, they have put divide this uh, with nali para with epidural without epidural multi para with epidural without epidural okay so nali para uh, without epidural so patient has got no pain relief so it was previously same we want birth to happen uh, within 3 hours of active uh, second stage of labor active means when the pushings are there so it was same now if the patient has got 1 hour of pushing 1 hour she has pushed inactively and there is no delivery so what to do you look reassess the patient if patient is progressing labor to continue continue pushing if there is no signs of progress then patient pv has to be done and consideration for arm if the membranes are there and if there is no progress even after doing arm then diagnose delay and senior review has to be done 
so ideally birth to be done within uh, like if the birth is not there even after 2 hours of pushing then senior it a patient to be reviewed by senior and decision about uh, place and mode of birth has to be done so in summary uh, after if the patient has pushed for 1 hour actively then they would review the patient if progress encourage them to continue if no progress then if membranes are there do arm if progress then it is fine if there is no progress then a delayed would be diagnosed and if the birth is uh, uh, not there 2 hours of pushing that time actively you have we have to act so uh, there would be senior review and the we have to decide now something either operative delivery or it will be cesarean section so decision about place and mode of the birth has to be taken so this was the same previously only little bit amount uh, little they have changed okay almost same now uh, if the patient has epidural nalli para with epidural everything is same only uh, like uh, with epidural after manner so uh, so this woman may have the passive stage of 2 hours after dilatation before they commence pushing so this part is different so because they have got passive like after full dilatation they would be in passive stage for 2 hours okay rest everything if the patient is on epidural is same now this is the flow chart for the patient uh, primary para without epidural so we see patient 1 to 3 means we review the patient after 1 hour of pushing we take decision after 2 hour of pushing and we want patient to deliver by 3 hours of pushing within 3 hours of active labor okay so same after 1 hour of pushing active pushing after 1 hour of active pushing you would reassess the patient if sign of progress ask her to push and continue the labor if no signs of progress but the membranes are there do uh, arm and if there is no progress uh, diagnose delay uh, patient has pushed for 2 hours and the, the, uh, like uh, if there is no delivery that time some review and decision for time and place uh, mode and place of birth apart from this it is uh, patient delivery should be completed within 3 hours so it is 1 2 3 for the premi gravida so this this flow chart explains you better now same thing patient is with epidural primary para with epidural everything is same only this part is added that this woman may have passive stage up to 2 hour after full dilatation before active pushing so their passive stage will be more so like after full dilatation in passive stage two more hours can be there if the patient is primary on epidural only this much is the change rest everything is same now uh, so this is all about the nalli para now coming to multi para in multi para we want labor to complete by 2 hours of act in active stage after 30 minute uh, of pushing review has to be done if progress ask the patient continue pushing if it is no progress then do pv and uh, uh, arm if the membranes are there then diagnose delay and further senior review if the 2 hour 1 hour of pushing there is no delivery then uh, uh, senior review and decision to be taken about place and mode of birth and in the epidural only one thing is more that they will have passive stage up to 1 hour more after full dilatation only this much is different rest is same now this this is the flow chart so okay, again i have to uh, i have put here 30 minute 1 hour and 2 hour so by 30 minute of pushing uh, if the patient is not delivered we would reassess and if uh, after 1 hour of pushing birth is not there we would require to have a senior review for the decision and place of birth we want our patient to deliver by 2 hours okay so this is this way it will be easy to remember 
so same thing is explained after 30 minutes of active pushing please assess reassess the patient if she is progressing well please ask her to continue if uh, no signs of if the progress is not there then do aminotomy if the membrane is there no progress diagnose delay uh, there had been one hour of pushing and no labor or no delivery what you will do uh, take uh, help from this uh, get reviewed by the senior and decision for a mode and place of work to be taken we want them to deliver by two hours so this is about the multi para uh, without having any epidural now if we if the patient has epidural again only one part is added they may have extra passive stage uh, up to one hour after full dilatation rest everything is same okay so that's all i had to say about this apart from this the, about the second stage delay and uh, now th th this is always a confusion because if we consider nice guideline it defines second stage of labor in two parts for uh, like uh, active uh, pushing uh, like um, passive stage is different and active stage with uh, they take everything in the management but in assisted birth vaginal birth guideline uh, there is no passive second stage they, they uh, whatever three hours or two hours they are saying it is they are including active and passive stage so this would be the confusion again but what can be done like uh, in my opinion uh, as the nice has been new nice guideline is updated in 2023 so uh, i do your mark your answer from the nice this i could only say but this would always be confusion because nice has defined uh, 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 like uh, active and passive differently and this uh, assisted birth guideline it takes it um, while uh, like um, answering it becomes confusion because it in include both active and passive so th this uh, this will be a gray area only so anyone any question till here okay now the delay in second stage of labor uh, support analgesia anesthesia review by the obstetrician if uh, oxytocin is if the like ox, uh, contractions are infrequent then uh, so, like oxytocin to be started this part is same what we read in the guideline and if the delay is there then obstetric review will be 15 to 30 minute okay so this part is important so when the patient was progressing well in the second stage of labor we were looking patient every one hour pv was every one hour but if the patient has a diagnosed delay then we want obstetric review or obstetric assessment every 15 to 30 minute time now uh, like uh, the uh, sometime th this would be important for part three people like whenever the patient uh, knows act uh, fully dilated and the delayed second stage of labor is there so you have to kind of offer the options so offer forceps or ventus or uh, if there is a pro prolonged second stage now if the patient declines forceps and ventus so uh, explain vaginal birth cesarean section or reconsidering her option vaginal birth cesarean section or reconsidering her option and you have to kind of explain this to the patient that cesarean section would be very difficult at this stage because baby head will head will be too low in the pelvis okay so this they wanted in counseling in part three stations but most of the students they don't do it and they do it wrong okay so always give option to the patient this is very very important um, you know uh, uh, slide for part three people when the patient is fully dilated and you have to offer option so please offer uh, review the patient and offer options accordingly and if she is refusing then these kind of counseling you have to put apart from this before uh, any uh, click instrument pain relief option has to be offered and this part <laughs> this we already know and this has been added in this guideline also when the patient is having instrumental birth single do uh, dose of uh, intravenous uh, co uh, comoxyclave or any alternative antibiotic to be given within six hours after cord clamping so this part was not there in like operative delivery guideline 
uh, that antibiotic has to be given within 6 hour of cord clamping so you have to kind of remember this and you have to use in your answer apart from this uh, patient uh, if the like uh, if you find that the vaginal birth is not possible, instruments are not possible, then you have to kind of explain them about the second stage cesarean section. So take knowledge from this and use in your stations is very important. Now, third stage, there is no change. There are two types of management we already know, active management, where we are using uterotonics, cord clamping, and cutting and control cord traction after signs of separation of placenta. Uh, this uh, ac uh, active third stage station and active and management for third stage of labor. This uh, station comes in part three exam as a teaching station. So all of the people who are going for part three has to uh, like uh, prepare this station active management for third stage of labor as a teaching topic. So you should you guys should know physiological management of third stage we know that there is no medications and the uh, no clamping of cord till the pulsation is stopped and delivery by spontaneously or maternal effort only apart from this this has been added uh, in the guideline outcome uh, like uh, less likely outcome for the woman having third stage of labor as compared to physiological so women will have less hemorrhage. We know because we are giving eutrotonic, she will have less requirement for blood transfusion. She will have less uh, 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 postpartum anemia. But what she will have more, she will have nausea, vomiting, headache, hypertension, readmission for bleeding more. Okay. So this, this part has been added new in this guideline. Previously, um, like um, these numbers were different. Apart from this outcome, these are same for both active and physiological management. Okay, so you guys, uh, part three, two people can need this. A table is new, retained placenta beyond one hour or need for manual removal. So this will be same. Antibiotics up to six weeks of discharge, it will be same. Satisfied third stage will be same and felt in control during labor. So this would be same. I don't know this put this was a table where the outcome was all similar so I just added it so you should have an idea if any questions come from here now about uh, third stage of labor they have uh, added many things and it is important to remember about the uh, third stage of labor now we oxytocin we know and this is syntometrin okay syntometrin is an injection where methyl uh, where uh, argometrin and oxytocin would be there now what they wrote about third stage so uh, our uh, syntometrin is more effective than oxytocin okay syntometrin is advised if the patient has a risk factor that would increase pph risk apart from this uh, it is more likely to call nausea vomiting Apart from this, it is contraindicate, uh, contraindicated if patient has PIH, severe hypertension, any cardiac, hepatic, and renal disease. Sematometrin is contraindicated if the patient has any hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, severe cardiac, hepatic, or renal disease. And whenever you are offering a syntometrin to the patient, please offer cyclizine uh, anti-emetic antimatic to be uh, added so this part was new in this guideline now syntometrin what what is the component so 500 microgram for uh, uh, methargin and uh, five interna five international unit for oxytocin so this is this you should know syntometrin apart from this now this they have changed active management for third stage of labor vaginal birth now they have given three regimes now part two people you are going to get question from here for sure so what they want in vaginal birth active management for third stage of labor either 10 units of oxytocin im this was previously also now additional there are two more options they have added five unit uh, oxytocin by uh, iv injection or five units of, uh, of oxytocin or 500 micrograms of argometrin in, uh, that is syntometrin okay 
immediately after birth of baby before the cord clamp is uh, clamped and cut so now for the there are three options for the uh, you know active management for third stage of labor if the patient is going for vaginal birth so this is a change in the this new guideline now if the oxytocin is used always and administered iv or so, sorry im and if it is iv it has to be very slow over 3 to 5 minute time 3 to 5 minute time now this has uh, completely changed in the cesarean section now they want uh, to uh, carbitocin by slowly iv injection for prevention of pph so active uh, so the management of act, active management of third stage in cesarean section complete change so carbitocin by slowly iv injection for to decrease pph okay so this this is complete change that uh, all all of you guys should be aware of now uh, this part was before only so uh, usually they don't want clamp to cord less than 1 minute but it has to be clamped before 5 minute and if the woman wants uh, to cut it later than 5 minute her wishes has to be respected Uh, so apart from this if the present if the uh, patient is on a physiological management and a placenta is not delivered so change into active management has to be done and uh, apart from this what, what definition of prolonged third stage of labor it is 30 minute more than 30 minute if it is active management and uh, it is uh, 60 minute uh, if it is physiological management of third stage of labor now retained placenta there should be iv access and a vaginal examination assessment and accordingly you have to manage it i am not speaking about the management for retained placenta because it is already given in your basic practical skill book now they have put risk factors for pph so it uh, it was not there previously now they have put and it is important to know also because you can get any uh, question from here apart from this if the patient has got high risk factor so a kind of you have to offer symptometrin um, for active management so few things you can occur, like remember from here if the patient is anemic at the onset of labor bmi more than 35 parity more than 4 multiple pregnancy polyhydramnios or like if any low lying placenta or fibroids any risk factor that arises during labor if there is oxytocin used during labor if there is a prolonged first or second stage of labor if there is sepsis if instrumental birth cesarean section shoulder dystocia or delay in delivery of placenta so this these are the few risk factors that you uh, part two people should know this because a direct question can come now this also has been added new in the guideline ss if your patient is on ssri or snri there is a small increased risk of pph okay so this part has been added new in this guideline it was not there previously that ssri and snri with it there is a small increased risk of pph so for part 3 people also if your patient is on any this kind of medications you have to counsel them for the risk of pph now pph management i won't speak too much about it because it is already uh, you know that but this is the sequence they want and apart from this uh, like uh, um, like first will be call for help then empty of bladder uterine massage uterotronics iv fluids cct and oxy oxygen and the target to get oxygen saturation will be 94 to 98% then for uh, administer first line of uh, postpartum uh, first line for postpartum hemorrhage now this part has been added new in the guideline and there are certain changes are there that i'll be speaking apart from this tranexa can be given 1 g iv over 10 minute time and it can be repeated within a uh, 30 minute time or half hour now what is the first line management for for pph so this part uh, uh, this guideline has become new now uh, what is the first part you will use for pph medication it will depend upon what she was taking before now if the uh, usually this is the sequence you will find 
that they are giving first preference to um, uh, symptomatrin. Oxytocin infusion if IV excess is there. After that, it will be carboprost. After that, it will be mesoprost. After that, it will be carbatosin. Now, so uh, I don't know how much it is necessary, but yeah, one time reading is important. So if the patient uh, is physiological management, physiological man patient has PPH and patient was on physiological management. So what you will do? Uh, no uh, symptomatrin first. And if IV excess is there, then oxytocin infusion. Second line will be carboprost. Carboprost, this we already know. Maximum eight doses. Intramuscularly, it is given 15 uh, minutes. And third line will be mesoprost. 800 microgram uh, either sublingual or rectal and uh, may be used if IV access is not there even we if you find a question that the patient has no IV access in that or like uh, in that situation even the mesoprostol can be used early also carbitocin will be at the end and it is slow IV injection now second scenario uh, patient was given oxytocin so oxytocin has already been given so now what you can give from the symptomatrin, you can consider giving uh, um, uh, argometrin because syntocinone has already been given. So give argometrin. Second, uh, if IV excess, then oxytocin infusion. Second is carboprost. Third is meso. And um, fourth is again uh, carb uh, carbitocin. So you have to kind of change this according to what the, the patient has got before. Now, if the patient is already given, uh, syntomatrin has already been given. So either IV uh, infusion or carboprost or apart from this, uh, second line will be uh, uh, meso and carbotocin. But if your patient is already on carbotocin, what you will do, you can use uh, methargine here. Why you, they are not giving oxytocin? Because uh, carbotocin is uh, oxytocin receptor only. So that means they are already giving that. So they give uh, argometrin. Second line will be carboprost, third will be mesoprost. Okay, so this this is this I have to sort of a created, uh, you know, a sequence. But if you read this, then uh, you know you will find almost they are following the same sequence, and the changes will be done according to that what they have used in the first line. So this is again a newly added identity in this guideline. So just reviewing this one time would be necessary. Now, this uh, is the same, I, I won't be repeating, but if, they, if the hemorrhage continues, so uh, make it sure that the patient has got no coagulation problem, all blood products to be done, examination under anesthesia, repair of trauma, and first surgery, before you go for any surgery, balloon tamponade is first, okay? So this we know uh, from the PPS guidelines, so I will not speak too much about it. Now, APGAR score, APGAR score, uh, 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 like they do it uh, routinely after one minute and five minutes. An assessment of, of peripheral oxygenation can be done by looking the color of nail beds. This part is newly added in 2023. Now, cord samples, it is almost the same. Cord sample, it is not routine. It is uh, like paired cord samples are taken for uh, uh, blood gas analysis after double clamp. Uh, using uh, 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 clamping of the cord using two clamps and uh, doing uh, like cord blood sample it is not given done routinely for every delivery it is done when the some complication is there apart from this uh, as early as possible skin to skin contact to be there and uh, like they should be explained very clearly about the baby positioning they should support the uh, the baby so much like head of the baby so the airway should not be obstructed apart from this breastfeeding to be started within first hour of the delivery within first hour of the delivery ideally within one hour this part again newly added in this guideline if the mother is taking ssri and snri the so there is a small risk of pul persistent pulmonary hypertension and neonatal adaptation syndrome so this is a, a a, a, new, a neonatal adaptation syndrome or neonatal uh, withdrawal symptoms. Apart from this, if the baby is fine, 
then uh, suction routinely not done if the heart rate respiratory rate and tone is fine now if the baby has significant meconium then observation for 1 hour 2 hour and 12 hourly till 12 hours it is required now if the baby is uh, like a pre, uh, born with a pre labor rupture of membrane then baby review has to be done for 1 2 uh 6 and 12 hours and this they would look for okay this part uh, has been added new in this guideline now if the patient is unable to pass urine 6 hour post delivery then uh, uh like uh, catheter is would be required the patient is unable to void then a catheter would be necessary so this part uh, again added new in the guideline apart from this if the patient has regional analgesia it is uh, important that the straight leg rise to be done 4 hours after the last anesthetic rose uh, dose if it is not possible then patient would require review so this part was not there previously this also has been added in the new guideline that's all i had to say about the guideline this is all updates apart from this uh, last part of the guideline is about the perineum care but uh, uh, about the tears but that part is already there in tear guideline so i have not put uh, that here that's all i had to say after that there are couple of questions so i try to change the answer according to new guideline and put some questions so anyone any question okay now just for few quick questions so though they, these are from the previous books only so uh, like uh, what is the most common contributor for medico legal obstetric units in uk failure to act failure to monitor adequately failure to recognize ctg failure to refer inappropriate use of oxytocin everyone knows this c1 failure CT. to recognize yes this is the common mistake now uh, the patient has got uh, uh, has come for induction of labor 2 cm cervix and 2 cm dilated and 2 cm long with the fetal head engaged so what will be the method and what is a new update in the new guideline answer prostaglandin yes but this is new update in the guideline so uh, uh, like in 2021 nice induction of labor guideline um, the woman with bishop score less than 6 induction of labor can be done with a dinoprost uh, with a vaginal tablet vaginal gel or control re released vaginal delivery system or with low dose 25 microgram oral mesoprostol tablet so this is the new update in the 2021 guideline about induction of labor Okay, so which magnesium, which uh, uh, gestational age magnesium sulfate can be offered? A man, twenty nine plus six weeks. Yeah, you everyone know that it is twenty nine plus six weeks. So if the patient has got thirty weeks plus three days, PS shows uh, cervix long, fully but slightly dilated, no rupture of membrane. What should be done as first? Yes. insulin like growth factor and uh, pamg testing tvs mom no history of ruptured membrane why you will do that test tvs mom yes tvs if the if it is more than 30 weeks then uh, either you will do ffn or you will do transvaginal ultrasound if ultrasound length is like uh, uh, more than 15 then the patient is not going to deliver otherwise patient will going to deliver okay so patient uh, uh, is using nitrous oxide for analgesia vaginal examination she is fully dilated no urge to push what will be the action plan reassess in one hour ma'am yes reassess in in one hour this is the common question that keeps on coming this is the same thing reassess in banar okay so patient uh, is 41 year old at 36 weeks of gestation induction of labor planned by 39 weeks 
So which intrapartum risk is not increased? Is there any, any additional risk? No additional risk. No additional risk. Yes. So how many uh, uh, like patient will develop postpunctural headache? 70 to 80 percent. Yes, 70 to 80 percent. Okay. Now here, 23 year old woman in uh, in established labor with a spontaneous rupture of membrane. Vaginal examination at 7:30. Cephalic, fully dilated, four centimeter dilated uh, cervix, fully effaced, and the four centimeter dilated. There are con good contraction three to four every ten minute, like 11:30, uh, five centimeter dilated, and uh, the sagittal suture in transverse position, no fetal descent, no mm -hmm. meconia, fetal heart is fine. What should be next? Assessing two hours. Assessing two hours. Yes, reassess in two hours. If, if it is like... Uh, less than four centimeter uh, uh, in in four hours less than two centimeter then uh, fetal heart is okay no caput and molding reassess in two hours and this this is uh, the from the new guideline if de uh, delay is suspected then offer support uh, options are uh, support pain relief and pb after two hours Now, 27-year-old uh, woman, uh, she is clinical finding 6.30. She is cephalic presentation, 4 cm dilated, 0.5 cm long cervix. At 10.30, 5 cm fully dilated intact membrane. At 12.30, cervical findings are not changed, and uh, but there is no membrane. Delivery so, by cesarean section. Why? Give me the reason. Because of it's almost been, we do not know when uh, the membranes have ruptured, but it is already 6.30 to 10.30, four hours, and then 10.30 to 12.30, two more hours. And hmm. uh, at this stage, uh, there is no membrane. So we don't know when the membranes have ruptured. Maybe somewhere between 10.30 to 12.30, and two hours have also passed by. So it is, we, can, we have diagnosed. Those implements 30 minutes, ma'am. Because it's yeah. a diagnose delay. But there yeah, is no is. mention about uh, contraction. So we can consider contractions are good. So, uh, though the, uh, like, uh, it is incomplete, but you see, uh, 4.30 is, uh, 6.30 and 10.30, four hours and uh, um, only one centimeter increase so there is suspected delay okay yeah after, so after in suspected delay we do pv after two hours so they have done pv after two hours okay in two hours cervical findings are not changed so you will diagnose delay so if the diagnosed delay is there so what you do if the uh, do pv after two hours no progress diagnose delay so either you will transfer or you will do assessment of the patient or you will consider oxytocin so what is there there is no transfer there is no reassessment reassessment pa pv is not there pv they have done though pa finding they have not given so answer is oxytocin okay so there is no cesarean why the i can't see an indication for cesarean section here I assume the uh, contractions are normal ma'am because they have not mentioned about it. Yes. See, uh, many times, you know, you will find the, this, though this question is incomplete because a fetal heart is not there and mm. uh, contractions are not there. How a person would answer? Yeah. But this, you will get this kind of only in the exam. And it is so confusing. So confusing. So if you see first two hours, progress less than one. So it was diagnosed delay. After diagnosed delay, we do PV after two hours. Okay. So it is confirmed delay. So in confirmed delay, this is the answer. 
because of that the answer is oxytocin okay so because follow all these tables that will help in you know answering so 35 year old woman with spontaneous rupture of membrane at uh, 1930 at 21 vaginal examination she is 4 cm at 1 hour that means after 3 hours it is contracting 2 to 3 in 10 minutes cervical finding are same fetal uh, minus 1 sagittal suture is transverse position what to do it is uh, it is very clear here contractions are less though it is not going according to the guideline but 2 to 3 contractions we want contraction to be at least 3 to 4 per 10 minute so answer will be oxytocin so a 32 year old woman in established labor for 14 hours pv done at 1230 fully dilated cervix clear fluid fetal station head at 0 right occipital posterior at 12:30 uh, un uh, she is unable to resist push and start voluntary efforts so what 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 should be the answer ss in 1 hour ma'am yes it should be ss in 1 hour because she is second stage of labor so pv has to be done 1 hour yes 1 hour so this we uh, we uh, read in the second stage of labor offer vaginal examination in active stage uh, hourly look for the position of head descent caput and molding okay this is easy so patient is seen in the antenatal clinic with a history of anxiety she doesn't want any medication what is non invasive measure likely to reduce her pain continuous one to one support yes that is very easy question fine the patient uh, is on a, a, a history of epilepsy she is seizure free for 7 years not taking any anti epileptic medication what method of pain relief to be avoided pethidine pethidine yes because there will be risk of seizures okay now patient delivered her first baby 10 in intra uterine uh, 10 units uh, i i am syntocinon given placenta not delivered she is not bleeding iv access hemodynamically stable what should be the action manual removal of placenta yes 40 unit no no so this is 40 minute delivery okay. has been done 40 minute ago The, uh, this is, appears to be confusing so because of reading of the question is very important so uh, active stage of management placenta if it is more than 30 minute it is a retained placenta definition do mrp okay so the 31 year old woman um th- uh, deliver at 34 weeks she delivers a baby by both mother and baby in good health she requests delayed cord clamping what should be the time frame 30 seconds to 3 minutes yes 30 no no it is 30 second to 3 minute this is from the preterm guideline so uh, 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 what they want wait till 30 second but not longer than 3 minutes if the mother and baby are stable from this line they have put the question now uh, like ctg is suspicious plan to conduct category 2 cesarean section how many minutes are decision to be taken 75 minutes ma'am 75 yes and these are the categories that we already know category 1 is within 30 minute category 2 is within 75 minute category 3 there is no maternal or fetal compromise and category 4 is a elective cesarean section the cesarean time is done when the suitable to women or the healthcare provider okay so patient uh, has uh, pushing in second stage of labor for 2 hours head is 2 fifth palpable a decision for cesarean section what complication is more likely in second stage of cesarean section rather than one first stage 
blood loss more than thousand plus more than thousand yes blood loss more than thousand this is from very old question from very old dog so what is a recommended uterotonic for third stage uh, of liver at cesarean section i units iv by international units iv ah you have to change the answer carbitocin yes carbitocin this is the okay. yes this is the old answer now it is offer carbitocin by uh, iv slowly for the prevention of pps so this is the new change so this is old answer and this is new answer and this is uh, this part we have uh, we have already discussed so this these are uh, these three things for the vaginal but this is for the cesarean section now a few things you should know about the carbitocin carbitocin is an uh, uh, how it acts carbitocin binds to oxytocin receptor because of that there will be rhythmic contractions because of increased contraction and increased uterine tone how to give 1 ml you can see that 100 microgram per ml uh, um, 1 ml to be given over 1 minute times uh, slowly iv this is from internet okay this all this carbitocin knowledge is from internet 1 ml uh, over 1 minute time uh, slowly iv now this few things you should rem- uh, just know when it is given carbitocin given iv so sustained uterine contraction within 2 minute last for 6 minute and followed by rhythmic contractions for 60 minutes when we are giving it this iv but carbitocin is also given by im only also if it is given im then sustained contraction uh, for 11 minutes and rhythmic contractions for 2 hours that is 120 minutes and half life for carbitocin is 40 40 minutes okay maybe in part 2 they ask you some questions so little bit about carbitocin you should know so this is very easy what is a, co- a common reason for litigation in shoulder dystocia regular plexus surgery man yes so uh, if the patient has a vagina breach plan who are planning vaginal breach how many of them would require cesarean section 40% yes so uh, if the breach presentation is there after 39 weeks how many times the perinatal morbidity is increased in vaginal birth and elective cesarean section four times no uh, in the uh, vaginal birth it is uh, uh, two per thousand in cesarean section it is 0.5 per thousand so it is four times now what is a successful predictor for v- successful vaginal birth after cesarean section history of previous vaginal birth previous vaginal birth yes so plan, uh, the success will be 85 if the patient has previous vaginal birth then uh, like uh, the uh, particularly v back then it is a single most predictor and the success will be 85 to 90% so this number is also important now uh, the patient uh, is taken to theater for trial of forceps fetal head is uh, to be 1/5 palpable per abdomen vaginal examination station is plus 1 What is the classification for forceps? Mid cavity. Mid. Mid cavity. Okay. Now, a uh, 45-year-old woman has been admitted with a preterm rupture of membrane 29 weeks. Complaints of in, in, uh, intermittent abdominal pain. Speculum examination uh, is an inconclusive. Abs- uh, so there is no pooling. or amniotic fluid uterus appear irritable fetus in cephalic presentation what should be the answer yell mom test for insulin like growth factor yeah insulin growth factor binding protein yes because you are not sure of rupture so answer is uh, l that is uh, Uh, test for insulin like protein factors now the patient has third uh, patient is in third weeks of pregnant 
थर्ड प्रेगनेंसी थर्टी टू प्लस थ्री वीक्स फॉलोड बाय स्पॉन्टेनियस कॉन्ट्रेक्शन टू डेज अगो वजैनल एग्जामिनेशन फुली फेस सेवन सेंटीमीटर डायलेटेड फीटल हेड इज जीरो स्टेशन बी एम आई थर्टी टू सी टी जी इज री एश्योरिंग बट वी आर अनेबल टू इंटरप्रेट दी टी जी बिकॉज ऑफ लॉस ऑफ कॉन्टैक्ट सो वॉट टू डू intermittent auscultation that could be the answer but fetal electro scalp electrode is there that can be attached so basically they want to say if the abdominal electrode cannot be put put scalp electrode no no you are right <laughs> intermittent auscultation sir intact okay. no madam yes yes because uh, ctg is reassuring Okay, so uh, a woman in the first pregnancy with severe preeclampsia, she has been given IV levetiracetam. Contraction frequency is three per ten. Fetus in cephalic presentation three fifth. Cervix vaginal examination fully face four centimeter dilated. Magnesium sulfate. <laughs> Magnesium sulfate because she is thirty nine weeks, and she is in established labor. Established labor. this question okay i have directly put the answer okay so lower uh, like uh, this is all about the uterotonic low risk women in first pregnancy uh, uncomplicated labor delivered by uh, spontaneous vaginal birth so what will be the uh, most appropriate uterotonic f yes, ma H ten hmm? international units I M F hmm. F syntosin on ten units I M F. So this is the answer, but this uh, this is again you should know that there are now you can get this as an option, ten uh, inter unit ten uh, units of synto I M, five units of synto I V or synto metal. Okay, three options now new guideline. Now a patient has got gestational diabetes, no medical problem. Twin one, uh, she has twin delivered by forceps and twin two delivered spontaneously. What to be given? Syntometrin. Yes, syntometrin. Syntometrin because uh, uh, in uh, oxytocin uh, plus uh, uh, argometrin is more effective. And if patient has any risk factor, then syntometrin is advised. Okay, so uh, patient has a risk factor twin is a risk factor, so give syntometrin. Okay, twenty-five year old woman with a fetal bradycardia, pushing for last thirty minute, and the patient is uh, head is his left uh, occipital posterior position below ischial spine. so fetal bradycardia second stage of labor what you will do ventus ventus so you have to do the expedition of birth so you can apply ventus okay so 32 year old woman with 40 weeks and 4 days Vaginal examination seven centimeter meconium stain lichen. Review of CTG after twenty minutes is un, un, not interpretable because of loss of contact. What to do? Fetal house electrode. Yes, because in this question uh, it is a meconium stain lichen. Meconium stain lichen is indication for continuous fetal monitoring. so if you can't do it abdominally then you have to put fetal scalp electrode that's all about it thanks for joining any one of you have got any question can ask any question people okay
so happy new year again and all the best for your exam you i can see that you have got exam uh, next week and because of that you know i took this class all the best bye thank you ma'am